This is Cray La Jolla, a continent on the rise and rule Minecraft server. Cray La Jolla has a rich history of kingdoms, diplomacy, and war. This is the complete history of the first 10,000 days of the rise and rule Minecraft server. At the height of Cray La Jolla's history stood two massive empires fighting to conquer the continent. These empires engaged in countless wars and battles. However, for years the two empires stood at a stalemate, with no one side gaining any leverage. While fighting raged on at the border, within these empires stood many cities. These cities thrived on this lush continent. But unknown to them, the hunger for power and ignorant ambition of the two empires would soon be the end of civilization on the continent. These two empires would take drastic measures to finally win the never-ending battle for supremacy. They started to raid each other's cities, spread disease, and kill off livestock. Cray La Jolla being a small continent fell into a dark period as the two empires hurled themselves into extinction. Massive fires, deadly disease, and total all-out war would eventually put an end to both empires. Cray La Jolla would soon become unlivable. But as the sands of time swept over the lands, all that remained were ancient ruins and artifacts of once powerful empires. After 5,000 years of silence, a new era would begin. A group of adventure settlers driven by the dream of prosperity arrived on the western shores of Cray La Jolla. These pioneers believed that this forgotten continent held the promise of a new beginning, a fresh start where they could build a better life for themselves. The settlers established a small village. They brought with them the knowledge and skills necessary for survival. Their village grew slowly but steadily. The settlers of this village began exploring the lush forest, mountains, and rivers of the continent, discovering an abundance of natural riches. They harvested timber and mined precious metals and gemstones. These resources not only sustained the villagers, but also became the foundation for an intricate trade network. They developed a currency and would become known as the Nation of Novarum. The abundance of these resources piqued the interest of others. News of the continent's remarkable offerings spread like wildfire, drawing the attention of explorers and fortune seekers from distant lands. In Novarum, markets sprung up in the village center. The village's central square became a vibrant hub of commerce, attracting traders and merchants who sought to capitalize on the bustling marketplace. Yet Novarum was just one of many destinations on this newly discovered continent. The increasing success of Novarum markets was nothing short of an inspiration to many. A few settlers who had initially arrived in Novarum decided to set up a new settlement just a few hundred blocks away from Novarum. This new community would soon come to be known as Palthia. Palthia emerged as a monarchy, with Ascario, one of the settlers, taking the throne as king. The proximity of Palthia to Novarum played a crucial role in its rapid growth and development. Novarum's markets provided a ready platform for Palthia to trade their resources and goods, and in return, Palthia contributed to the prosperity of Novarum through the resources and products they brought to the table. However, the influx of people to this new continent didn't only take place in Novarum. On the other side of the continent, on a lush island, a coastal settlement was formed. This settlement was called the Farmo Kingdom. But one day, the King of Farmo mysteriously disappeared, without a trace, leaving the nation in a state of disarray and confusion. But a prominent political faction within Farmo emerged. This group was the Banana Company, a major seller of bananas worldwide. The Banana Company renamed Farmo to the Banana Kingdom. But after the king returned, all power went back to the king, and it was once again called Farmo. And I know what you're thinking, that's just... And you would be right. The next four nations we'll be talking about are located on the northern side of the map. These nations found themselves in close proximity, and with the pursuit of connection, three of the nations built an extensive road, binding these lands together. The first of these nations was Luxlancia, an absolute monarchy ruled by King Zilge. Luxlancia was a beautiful nation located next to a giant lake and nestled in between mountains. Then down the road was Rival Hall. Rival Hall was a home to a community of Vikings, people who were determined to keep their ancient traditions alive. They celebrated ancient rituals, festivals, and ceremonies, ensuring that the flame of their Viking identity burned brightly. The third nation connected by this road was Borealis. Borealis was a social capitalist federation, a unique blend of social welfare and capitalism. But what was so unique about Borealis is that it was the only nation at the time with two cities. 
the people of Borealis were a diverse group and were strengthened by the two cities coming together to become one nation. Unfortunately for Borealis, the central government keeping the two cities together collapsed, causing Borealis to disband as a nation. The one city of Borealis, Korsbar, would become a city of Rival Hall. However, for the capital city, it would become a ghost town. The next nation is Pasa, the northernmost nation on the continent, located in the only snowy region on the map. The history of Pasa is marked by the escape of its people from a cruel dictatorship. Why? 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 Which led them to settle in this challenging new environment. The extreme temperatures and scarcity of food have made living conditions in Pasa difficult. However, the players have adapted to their circumstances by relying heavily on fish as a primary source of sustenance. The current leader of Pasa harbors ambitions of spreading his religion globally and becoming the world's pope. While many look at Jogo's ambition as nothing more than a foolish dream, the nation of Quasar is none too pleased. Quasar, located in the jungle on the west side of the map, operates under a triarchy, meaning it has three leaders sharing power. Quasar perceives Jogo's ambition as disruptive and unfair to the current religious structures of the world. Now, surely this simple dispute and ideas won't lead to any conflicts in the future. Thousands of blocks away from Quasar, we find this giant island. On this island, we find the nation of Kavir. This island has a rich and tragic history. It was originally inhabited by a large tribe of people who had been on the island for generations, possibly even before the people of Novarum arrived. However, a catastrophic event in the form of a massive fire swept through the island, resulting in the destruction of over half the land. This devastating fire forced the survivors of the tribe to relocate to the northern plateau on the island. It was on this plateau that the nation of Kavir was eventually formed. The formation of Kavir was a response to the need of greater organization, resources, and safety in the wake of this destructive fire. The island has been slowly recovering from this massive fire. However, the wounds from the fire will be remembered for an eternity. This brings us to our last nation, the nation of Paxterra. Paxterra is a unique island nation located in the southern Akakoan Sea. The current leader has been a driving force behind Paxterra's ambitions to expand its influence in the region. One of the most significant recent developments in Paxterra's expansion efforts is the claim of these three islands in the Akakoan Sea. These islands, previously uninhabited and largely untouched, are now a part of Paxterra's sovereign territory. But the expansion doesn't stop with the islands. Paxterra has also established a settlement at the mouth of this significant river in the region. This strategic location provides them with access to a vital trade route and opens up opportunities for commerce and cooperation with neighboring nations. These nine nations stand as the creators of the new era for this continent. Their collective vision and determination bring about fruits of success, breathing life into this promising epic of discovery and progress. However, they must remain ever vigilant, for the road ahead is filled with challenges. For these ambitious nations, they must learn the lessons of the ancient kingdoms that came before them, the rise and fall of great civilizations, the overextensions of empires, and the decay of once thriving cultures are cautionary tales. A new beginning has started, and it's time for these new nations to rise and rule. Cray La Jolla is a continent of great beauty, diversity, and ambition. Its bustling cities are a testament to human innovation and progress. The nations here have thrived through collaboration and peaceful coexistence. This harmony is the product of diplomacy and understanding. But beyond the borders of the established nations, vast unclaimed lands stretch as far as the eye can see. Deep within these lands lie small but growing tribes. These people have lived in relative isolation, embracing their traditions and shrouding themselves in mystery. Their existence has mostly been forgotten, often overlooked by the busy civilizations. Simpleton, I want you to walk north 200 blocks and plant our flag. We shall expand our borders. Um, sir, I do think there's people already living on that land. Then tell them to shoo. With all due respect, sir, I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, it's not like these tribes are dangerous. Okay, fine. But unbeknownst to most, tensions have been building steadily over the years. These tribes would occasionally explore the unclaimed lands looking for food and other resources. Rarely did they ever run into other tribes, but this time, 
it would be different. A large tribe located at the center of the map called Imthala was a very developed tribe. With large buildings and a large population, they were very close to becoming seen as an official nation. Imthala was building good relations with the official nations. However, relations with the other tribes were not good. Other tribes were also looking to become official nations. However, these other tribes had a much smaller population and were far less developed. If they had any chance of becoming a nation, a giant power shift between the tribes would have to take place. On day 2279, a large group of Amphalians got on horses and headed south towards the desert. This wasn't unusual, as it was common for exploration of this kind. However, just as the Amphalians got to the desert, they were met by three players two from the New Mycelium tribe and one from the Clavaria tribe. What started as just a standoff quickly became a conflict when the Amphalians pushed forward on the two tribes. New Mycelium and Clavaria saw this as a threat and charged forward. The three tribes clashed. Amphalia overpowered the two tribes, pushing them back and crossing the river. But New Mycelium and Clavaria didn't back down. They made a strong push back and were able to hold off the Amphalians. However, during this battle, the two players from New Mycelium were killed, and one player from Amphala was killed. Although just three casualties, this was the first deadly conflict for this constant in the new era. And this would be the start of a far more deadly war. The player from the Clavaria tribe quickly got on his horse and headed off north to try and find other tribes to hopefully make alliances and warn of a potential Imthala attack. This is Madheim. Although it's not much of a tribe as it only has a population of two, for now we're going to call it a tribe. Madheim was the site of a religious temple, the Temple of the Harmonic Faith. One of the residents of Madheim was known as the Harmony Seeker, a self-proclaimed prophet seeking peace through ancient rituals. While the Harmony Seeker was in the temple, the other resident of Madheim headed off into the woods and into a giant flower field on a hunting trip. While in the flower field, he was met by Accent from the Clavaria tribe. Nate, 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 I'm French, I'm French, I'm French. Uh, look, my, my guys got attacked and uh, we need to run. They're calling me to to far from home so we can team up against Amthala because all of my guys just got killed by them. Okay, yeah. fine, let's go. Uh, Accent warned him of the potential Amthala attack and the two of them headed off to find other tribes. On their way, they ran into a wanderer who was found out to be from Amthala. Oh, there's someone here. Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Hey! Okay, well... Hey! No, 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 I'm gonna... peaceful, man. I'm no, gonna... I, I don't want to shoot you. I want, I want, I want you to come here. Look, my, I put my weapon down. Look, I won't cross the river. We can talk like man to man over the river. I just need to ask you a couple Are questions. Are you from a tribe? Have you seen anybody, um, walk around these parts recently? You see any, you see anything fishy? I don't like that. He's, no. I don't like that he's silent. I don't like okay, the pause. Yeah, yeah. Let's just, I'm scared. Just we gotta get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Well, he doesn't Bye. seem he's... to have gear, but... Hey! Oh, 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 he's shooting. That's rude. Yeah, should we kill him? I can walk up him. Let's go. Okay, fine. Let's go. Oh! <laughs> okay. <laughs> I told you. Oh my god, okay. Well, wait, hold on. I, oh, I fell shit. off. Okay. You went yeah, too fast. Fine. A small group of loyal players from the once nation of Borealis eventually heard of the rumors, and they too gathered and headed south. For the next couple of days, the many tribes of the world wandered the continent. I think this way is where I want to go, but I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know, and I don't wanna check the map. I wanna pretend, I wanna like act like I don't have one. Like I'm actually in the middle of a war. I can't see. <laughs> it's too dark. A chicken! Chicken, get in the boat, I will save you! I'll save you. I'll save you, I'll save you. I've probably been swimming out for for days. Get in the boat, chicken. Come with me. I said, get in the boat, chicken, you're coming with me. Okay, that was easy. Please be safe. Okay, please. I need you. Okay? I saved you and I will not let Pax ter- By now, the news of the conflict spread. Nations heard of the rumors, but largely didn't care. Sir, did you hear? The tribes are fighting each other. There could be a giant war. Oh no. I don't care. I am here to tell you guys, uh, well, not my words, more of my leader's words. And although I don't really want to say this, 
I'm kind of forced, but basically, I need you guys to shoo. <laughs> On day 2283, most of the tribes would eventually meet in Farmo. Hey, Nate, they're on the platform. They're just sitting there, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's I think I hit one. an arrow. Yo, 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 yo. Vita, Vita. 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 Vita's not, Vita can't fight though. Oh, what the heck? Some Farmo citizens went over to see what was going on. But suddenly, Amthala and another tribe by the name of the Forge showed up just off the coast. And a battle started. The tribes of Madheim, Clavaria, and Borealis stationed on the beaches of Farmo fought to keep Amthala from advancing onto the beach, both sides raining down arrows on each other. It seemed like no one side was making any progress. There are uh, amphibians or something, I don't know. Take some bread. I'll support you. Take some bread. Take some bread. Some from the might of our coalition. We shall perish. We shall perish. Oh, that's a good one. But Anthala's side started taking heavy losses, and the Farmo citizens that showed up got stuck in the crossfire and were killed. This battle quickly became more than just a war between tribes. Now even official nations saw casualties. As the battle went on, eventually the firing of arrows stopped. The Anthala side faced a devastating loss. Madheim, Clavaria, and Borealis, with the advantage of solid ground, were able to hold off the attack. Clear out the field. Make sure. I need. We need a perimeter search. Um, All right. Probably. We're all on the call, so I can else. tell them to do it. But yeah, we need a perimeter search first. Make sure there's nothing left. However, the war wasn't over. The last three tribes were now against each other. But to avoid any more loss of innocent life, the nation of Rival Hall agreed to hold the last part of the war in their coliseum. Three players from Borealis, one player from Madheim, and one player from Clavaria was all that was left. They all agreed to fight 1v1s, and the last player alive would be considered the winner of the tribe wars, granting their tribe to be recognized as an official nation. Tell who's winning, but this is a battle. Oh, he's gonna hit again. Probably. Yeah. Oh, he's down. Three, two, one, go. Oh, I. If he doesn't go on the battlefield. Surprise. Oh! Oh! oh yes, I did it! Oh my god, I'm so sorry. For the final round, just three players remain, all from different tribes. The winner of this round would decide what tribe becomes a nation. And we can only render a name. <laughs> That's all you need. I'm not gonna make it. Oh, uh, do not shoot the crowd. Oh no. It looks like the 2v1 is constantly shifting to who is the one. Oh, they, they have engaged. Borealis is out. It is Mycelium versus, I don't know where Nate's from. No! Hey, where are you? Returning to Clavaria with news that would forever change history, Axon informed the people of Clavaria of his victory. On day 2286, a momentous announcement was made. Clavaria had achieved the status of an official nation, a sovereign entity with its own distinct identity. With the new nation forming, the people of New Mycelium merged with Clavaria. Clavaria promised protection of the new mycelium land, and the two would become stronger together. To symbolize this harmonious union, a new flag was crafted, a testament to the shared triumphs and aspirations of the Clavarian people. 
Axent, now the undisputed king of Clavaria. The people hailed him as a hero, recognizing his heroic actions and leadership during the tribe war. The popularity of Clavaria soared as new players quickly joined this new nation. But for the other tribes, the outcome of the tribe war would have a far darker consequence. The tribes, once formidable in their own right, now found themselves painted as violent barbarians, perceived as a potential threat to the established nations. This perception fueled a wave of unprovoked attacks, as players from official nations sought to eliminate any perceived threat before it could materialize. In all the chaos, the tribe of Amthala sought refuge in Luxlancia, one of the more benevolent official nations. Meanwhile, the unclaimed lands of Kray La Hoya became a desolate no man's land, a battleground where players from various nations attempted to wipe out all remaining tribes. With the help of Luxlancia, Imthala was able to protect their land and resources. And with Luxlancia campaigning for Imthala, just a few days after the tribe war, Imthala would become recognized as an official nation. What started as an accidental meetup between two tribes escalated into a devastating war. The war left Imthala overwhelmed. But now with the status of being an official nation, will Amthala seek revenge? Or will a new chapter of peace come about for the continent of Kray La Hoya? The aftermath of the tribe war had left the world in a strange state. The once open and free exploration of unclaimed lands became a cautious endeavor, with players hesitating to venture into unknown territories. Nations gripped by the fear of potential conflicts became increasingly vigilant and defensive when foreign players visited their territories. In response to the heightened tensions, many nations found stability through the formation of pacts and alliances. These diplomatic agreements aimed to establish a sense of security and deter aggression, fostering a delicate balance on the continent. However, the pervasive unease lingered, and it seemed that the slightest spark could ignite a massive conflict. The nations of Amthala and Luxlancia stood as symbols of cooperation, their close relationship dating back to even before the tribe war. This partnership, forged through trade, open borders, and a commitment to each other's protection, became a beacon of stability in the difficult post-tribe war era. But this relationship between the two nations would be tested when a group of Kavir citizens embarked on a journey that would forever alter the course of history. Unbeknownst to them, their path would intersect with Amthala. Once arriving in Amthala, a misunderstanding led to a violent clash between the Kavir citizens and Amthalans, leaving some Amthalan lives lost. In the face of this crisis, Amthala turned to its long-standing ally, Luxlancia, invoking the terms of their alliance for protection and support. However, the response took a dark turn, what began as a call for assistance evolved into a brutal confrontation when Amthala and Luxlancia began to push forward and attack the Kavir citizens instead of just defending the city. The Kavir citizens were slaughtered. Predictably, the Kavir government, informed of the tragedy, was left seething with anger. Both sides outraged by the deaths caused by the other side. And as propaganda spread like wildfire, diplomacy failed, and Kavir declared war on Luxlancia. Amthala found itself at a crossroad. Despite its initial willingness to stand by Luxlancia, external pressures mounted. Farmo, a strong global power, saw the potential of a larger conflict and issued a stark ultimatum to Amthala. If Amthala were to side with Luxlancia in this war, Farmo would enter the war on Kavir's side. This forced Amthala to stay out of the war, making this a conflict between Luxlancia and Kavir alone. But this pressure by Farmo was disliked by many Amthalan citizens, and would be the start to Amthala and Farmo tension. Far from the battlegrounds, Novarum stood as a beacon of prosperity. The world market within its walls reached an all-time high, drawing nations from every corner of the continent. The strategic location of Novarum facilitated the seamless transportation of goods, creating an economic hub that seemed invulnerable to the geopolitical storms brewing elsewhere. But the tranquility of Novarum's prosperity was about to be disrupted by an unexpected and ominous presence. An unusual ship spotted just off the shore, looming like a shadow on the horizon. This vessel, unlike the typical trading ships that frequented Novarum. Two days later, the unknown ship reached the Novarum dock, and from its bowels emerged a man with an eye patch, a figure who would soon reshape the history of Novarum. This man 
who identified himself as Bob Jr. And his entourage swiftly and decisively took control of the unsuspecting town. The flags changed and Novarum was reborn as Bobonia. The town, now under Bob Jr.'s rule, underwent a transformation that extended beyond a mere change in name. The once tranquil streets were now filled with the echoes of a new regime. The economic landscape of Bobonia was reshaped as prices in the market soared, creating a wave of discontent among the citizens. The choices made by Bob Jr. sparked an outrage that resonated beyond the newly named nation. Other nations observed the abrupt changes in Novarum. The situation escalated when rumors of missing shopkeepers began to circulate. The once thriving market now carried a dark undertone. Did Bob Jr. kill off some of the shopkeepers? As accusations were hurled at Bob Jr. and his men, the eye-patched leader dismissed these allegations with smug confidence, claiming them to be baseless and part of a smear campaign against his rule. I did not kill those shopkeepers. Then why is there a body behind you? He's taking a nap. Okay, then where did the other shopkeepers go? On vacation. Bob Jr. is a liar. He's a mur- That wasn't me, I swear. The controversy reached a tipping point when the nation of Rivalhall anchored its massive ship off the shores of Bobonia. Bob Jr. would use this as an opportunity for propaganda, asserting that the intimidating presence of Rival Hall ship had scared off the missing shopkeepers. But the other nations saw through the manipulation, and threats and insults were directed at Bob Jr. and his newfound nation. Amidst the mounting pressure, Bob Jr. declared war on Palthia, signaling the beginning of his global conquest under the guise of eliminating tyrannical leaders. The continent now stood on the precipice of conflict, with Bobonia at the center of a storm fueled by deception, accusations, and a pursuit of power. With Bobonia and Palthia getting ready for war, back in the middle of the continent, Luxlancia and Kavir charged at each other. The two nations would meet at a midpoint, in a small field surrounded by mountains. Luxlancia arrived on the horseback and were able to quickly take control of this battle. Kavir was not prepared for the quick attack, and Kavir would take a devastating loss in the first battle. The outlook for Kavir winning this war was unlikely, but Kavir would not back down. As Luxlancia pushed forward, the next battle would start after Luxlancia pushed into Kavir land. Luxlancia started off strong, knocking down the Kavir army. But once Luxlancia was able to push up the mountain into the Kavir city, the Kavir soldiers used their knowledge of the city as an advantage and would slowly pick off the Luxlancia soldiers in the street. Surprisingly, Kavir would pull off a victory and would leave Luxlancia severely damaged. Kavir took this opportunity to hit Luxlancia hard. Kavir rushed towards Luxlancia and would invade the Lux capital. The Luxlancians stationed on top of a massive temple. The Kavir soldiers would have to make the treacherous climb up the temple. But once reaching the top, arrows rained down from the temple, but Kavir was quick and Luxlancia had limited weapons and gear. Quickly making their way up the temple, Kavir was able to take over and secure a victory. In a surprising defeat, Luxlancia had lost the war. Kavir demanding reparations from Luxlancia, and for Imphala, seeing their close ally get defeated was a hard sight to see. But it would only get worse for Amthala after a group of Amthalans were accused of stealing from the tribe of Borealis. Although just a tribe, Borealis was still a strong group. You guys stole from us! And what are you gonna do about it? I don't know, kill you or something. Do you really think we are scared of you? because we are terrified. We surrender. Amthala just surrendered to a tribe. This only angered many of the Amthalan citizens even more, 
feeling like their leader was weak. And shortly after this, Borealis would once again become noticed as an official nation. With Lux Lancia dealing with defeat and trying to pretend it never happened, and Amthala facing internal disputes, back over in Bobonia, Bob Jr. ordered his men to invade the Palthia capital. The Bobonian soldiers rushed into the city quickly. Palthia was unprepared for the amount of soldiers and gear the Bobonian army had. Fire! 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 Everyone take cover! Oh, they, they have the handguns! Take cover! Oh, take cover in the trees! Take cover in the trees! Why do we need to take cover? Oh, the tower! We go back on the tower, we just start going. No! no. There, I've, I've there. Dude, we're, we're a three-man tower. They can't hit all of it's us. three-man tower. Oh, 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 oh. Tower, get up to the get tower. Up Ascendant. Hey, I hit, I hit the the invasion was so quick, there was no time for other nations to get involved. And within a few minutes, Palthia fell and would become occupied by Bob Jr. The rest of the world now knew they had to do something to end Bob Jr.'s reign of terror. However, the nation of Amphala had some of its own problems to deal with. After some Farmo citizens entered the nation of Amphala, they were killed. But the main problem is Amphala and Farmo had a non-aggression pact, and Farmo took the killing of their citizens as aggression. Amphala once again in the middle of a controversy. And to make matters worse, the blame for all of this was put on the Amphalan leader. And so the Amphalan citizens got together and overthrew the king. A new leader would be implemented, and this leader looked to end the impending war with Farmo. But the only way for Amphala to avoid this war was to become a Dominion of Farmo. And so, the new leader agreed to terms. Amphala became a Dominion of Farmo. Which again, would upset many Amphalan citizens. Amphalan citizens would split into different groups. Some supported the new government, but others didn't. This led to the creation of a movement called Free Amphala. The leader of this movement attempted to get all Amphalan citizens to rise up against the government again, but many declined. So the few loyal members of Free Amphala would make their own country just northwest of Amphala, called the Free Amphalan Republic of Van Noria. Later, the southern town of Amphala demanded independence and would become the nation of Tribel. And then even more Amphalan citizens demanded independence and would become the nation of Valazor. And after all this, Amphala would become Marino, the name of their capital city. All new Amphalan states would become dominions of Farmo, except one. For Amphala and Luxlancia, two nations who would do anything for each other, were ultimately separated and picked apart one by one. The new Amphalan state still wanting to maintain good relations was the only hope left for Amphala. But just as it seemed things would calm down, Bob Jr. declared war on Rival Hall. After Bob Jr. declared war on Rival Hall, the other nations became very upset at Bob Jr.'s actions. Nations started preparing for war, and it seemed like everyone knew that a massive war against Bob Jr. was inevitable. It was only a matter of time. Farmo, now in the possession of many dominions, would be the first to declare war on Bob Jr. and side with Rival Hall. This would quickly convince Marino and New Mycelium to join in and declare war on Bobonia. However, Bobonia would not be alone. Because of a full military alliance, the nation of Quasar would join the war on Bobonia's side. Seeing that Bobonia now has help in the war, other nations started to fear that more nations may side with Bobonia. So, Borealis and Kavir would declare war on Bobonia to help defend the continent. Farmo would then call on all of its dominions to also join the war. It would then be announced that the old leader of Palthia was murdered by Bob Jr. after he attempted to retake the throne. This would anger the rest of the nations even more, and shortly after, three more nations would declare on Bobonia. As it seemed more and more likely that the allied forces would defeat Bob Jr., in a turn of events, Lux Lancia and Passa would side with Bobonia in the war. The reasoning behind this was unclear, but now there was a possibility that Bob Jr. could win this war and take over the entire continent. Nearly every nation began focusing on getting armor, weapons, and food. Quick, make leather armor! Uh, sir, I don't even know where leather comes from. Well, it comes from... I think it comes from... I don't know where it comes from, just figure it out! <gasps> Is this leather? No. Is this leather? No. Is this leather? Yes, give me him. <sighs> On day 4642, all the nations would meet in this giant flower field. They all grouped up and waited till their commanders gave them the call to attack. 
I'm on my own team. Clouds, you ain't no leader. Get out, here get out of here. Before our battle. Okay, where you at? Attack! Bo team on the battle, miss! Let's go! Beef team! Beef. Up and over! Yeah, build like it's yep, Fortnite. I'm doing, I'm doing build up. walls like it's Fortnite. Good idea. Guys, I'm scared. Hope I'm scared. Oh, look, it's... Oh, my... See, look at that. Let's go. Vanorian stay together. Kill them. Make them pay for all of their crimes. Put them... Make sure they're on the naughty list for Christmas. I can't even see anything. Right, Nate, don't rush. Nate, don't rush. You'll lose. You'll lose. All right, if you do, build a wall, all right? Build a wall. Oh, what is this, Fortnite? The Alliance would first send their horse unit at the Babonia Alliance, who was stationed in a fort. Firing between the two started, and the first battle of the war against Babonia had begun. The horse unit made little to no progress, both sides firing at each other but no casualties. The alliance would fall back, and then send all units directly at the Babonian alliance. Go, go, go! No! the bell Now we're talking. Babonia will fall! Viva la Venoria! Viva la Venoria! Viva la Venoria! A massive battle broke out. Players quickly building walls and taking cover. Arrows rained down from every direction. Drake is going. Friendly shot. Jason. This is friendly Get fire. Jason. Friendly fire. Watch Downward out. Fire. They're trying to flank it. They're trying to flank it. Death to Babonia. Oh Where are they? It's Zild. Report down. Zild is dead. A few units from the Alliance Army attempted to flank the Babonia Army from the left. While distracted, more and more would flank from the left, catching the Babonia Alliance Army off guard, and slowly but surely wiped out the Babonians. All I know is Viva la Venoria! Flank, we're flanking on the. Yeah. Man, there is so much like chaos. <laughs> oh, I'm on fire! Sorry, 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 sorry. It's like the tank. Keep going. No, no shot. Oh, one down! Viva Venoria! Oh, no, horse down! Oh, death! Viva la Venoria! Push out! Free Cray La Hoya! Free Cray La Hoya! Free Cray La Hoya! This is your Cray La Hoya! Don't mind me, just gonna. Oh, they're strong! Just gonna sleep in the middle of combat. No! I was slain by my own side. After a long, hard-fought battle, the Alliance prevailed as victorious, a crucial victory in this war. This would by far be the deadliest battle in the history of the continent, for now. Bob Jr. ordered his men to fall back to Babonia, and the Alliance would quickly regroup and heal, then march towards Babonia. The Alliance stationed on a fort on top of the hill overlooking the Babonia city. There is two things that I must Everything admit Bob has done well. Alright? The first thing oh, well. is, he has managed to Run make it. enemies base, friends. Anyway. I have never seen so many countries yeah, work together I'm still for not friends goal. with all of you, but I have a common yeah, goal. To Kill all the ribbon hole! Bro, you know what this reminds me of? This feels just like, I don't know if any of you ever played uh, Hold Fast. But if any of you have ever played Hold Fast, this is exactly what Hold Fast is like. Oh, oh, are we going? We must go! Oh, go, go, go! As the Alliance rushed in for the next battle, Bob Jr. and the Babonians attempted to get in their ship and possibly flee the continent. 
but the Alliance wanted Bob Jr. and his ruthless army to pay for what they have done. With the advantage of the boat, the Bobonia Alliance held their ground strong, preventing the Alliance from boarding the ship. Get out of here! Take your boat and leave! Get out of here! We don't want you here! Up and over! They're on the sails! They're on the sails! Up and over! For a great lawyer! I'm just smacking anyone! Was it Babonian? I know I found Nate! I see Nate's here! Attack! V Block Great La Hoya! Oh my Who killed me with Fortnite Burger? There's so many people! I don't know what's going on! Whoa! Please! I'm not Babonian! I'm sorry, Harry! I can't tell what's going on! Beep Love and Noria! Beep Love and Noria! Oh, that's a strong. Oh no, that's strong. I heard it a lot. Real bad. Ouchie. <laughs> hey man, I just want to let you know. Good luck. Everyone's kind of dying. Don't hurt me. Retreat. Whoever has more of them. Oh, Palthera's here. Palthera. Push up. Remember what they did! Even after a large group rushed the boat and got on board, the Babonia Alliance was able to hold them off and retake the boat. The battle went on for quite some time, but the Babonia Alliance stayed firm on the boat and at times seemed like they might even win this battle. But eventually, the Alliance was able to regroup and made another push onto the boat. This time, they would finally take control of the boat and wipe out the remaining Babonians. The Alliance has won the war, and Cray La Hoya was freed from Bob Jr.'s tyranny. Although a victory, there were many casualties, and it will take a long time to recover. But the first thing to be done was all the nations met in the Rival Hall Church to discuss what would happen with Bobonia. As a king of Vanoria, I'm actually kind of surprised that we're here and no one has even mentioned it. Uh, seems like you all want something for yourselves, but I think something that can help out the entire continent is we need Bob Jr. to pay the price directly. Maybe it's in a court case, put him on trial, or we just send him off on his way. Like, we gotta, this is the main problem here. Rival Hall's demands are to pretty much reinstate Palthea to make sure that we get compensation for the war. Farmo wants to first of all thank every nation that took part in this coalition against the ruthless, tyrannical Bob Jr. We hope that Quisar could become a dominion of Farmo. We'd like Bavonia, or whoever's taken over from them, to provide iron armor to our citizens. Cray La Hoya was saved from a cruel dictator, but for Farmo, their history would be reshaped after the passing of their king. With a new king in power, the future of Farmo is uncertain. The aftermath of the massive world war against Bobonia put the world in an era of reconstruction and recovery for nations across the continent. The conflict had left a trail of devastation, both in terms of player casualties and the depletion of vital resources. As nations grappled with the daunting task of rebuilding, a fragile peace settled over the continent. However, this period also witnessed the birth of new nations. Among these emerging nations was Palthera. After being freed from Bobonia and gaining independence, Palthea emerged as Palthera. And with the death of the old leader, a new leader was at the helm. Palthera sought to redefine itself in the post-war landscape, and the nation was determined to forge its path of independence. Despite the aspirations for a new beginning, Palthera encountered a rocky start. Palthera was upset with Quasar, a nation that sided with Bobonia during the war. Palthera's leadership, still nursing wounds from the conflict, issued stern warnings to Bobonian supporters, threatening imprisonment. This included players from Quasar. But the situation was further complicated by Quasar's geopolitical position. No longer an independent entity, Quasar had become a dominion of Farmo. Farmo, now responsible for Quasar's well-being, responded with displeasure to Palthera's threats. If you lay just a single finger on Quasar, I will kill you and your family. Just like Palthera, nations across the world faced unforeseen challenges that would reshape their destinies. The young nation of Vanoria found itself at a historical turning point. 
Day 52 at 73 became a pivotal moment. Just north of Vanoria, a neighboring nation faced the threat of losing its sovereignty. With dwindling population and a sluggish economy, the leader of this nation stood at the helm of a historic decision. In a desperate bid to salvage their nation, they turned to Vanoria, seeking a lifeline that would ensure its survival. Vanoria responded to the neighboring leader's plea for assistance. The Prince of Vanoria, along with other members of the monarchy, devised an unconventional solution a royal wedding between the leader and the king of Vanoria. However, just days before the much-anticipated wedding, tragedy struck Vanoria. The reigning king fell gravely ill, and to the surprise of the nation, the king passed away. This unexpected turn of events put the prince into an unforeseen role as the new king of Vanoria. The new king would now be the one to marry the nation leader. In the wake of the king's passing, Vanoria embraced change as it fell into a new era under the leadership of its newly crowned king. As a symbolic gesture of this transformation, the nation sought to redefine its identity by altering its flag. This visual representation of change reflected Vainori's determination to move forward into a future untethered by the shadows of its past. While some nations dealt with challenges during the post-war rebuilding era, others found themselves presented with unexpected opportunities. This narrative unfolds in the southern part of the continent, where settlers arrived on the South Island. These pioneers built a small town and soon found themselves thriving in this new environment. The establishment of Ostania became a testament to the resilience and adaptability of these settlers in the face of uncertainty. However, the success and prosperity of Ostania sparked tensions with the nation to the north, Kavir. Unhappy with the presence of newcomers on what they considered their island, the Kavir government faced a critical decision. Rather than resorting to violence, they recognized an opportunity for diplomatic solution, leading to the peaceful merge of Ostania with Kavir. And by peaceful, they forcibly kicked out the Astania players and took the land for themselves. Kavir and Astania would not be the only two nations uniting. Mazva and Valazor, recognizing the potential for greater strength through unity, chose to merge and form the Republic of Eskatan. This would make Eskatan the second largest nation in terms of population. But the significance of this union extended beyond mere numbers, representing a strategic alliance that promised mutual growth and prosperity for the citizens of both former nations. Farmo, currently the largest nation by population, was once again getting involved in continental conflicts. A new and unconventional nation formed in the desert called the United Communist Republic of the Desert. This new anarchist nation, devoid of any centralized government, laws, or morals, posed a stark contrast to the traditional structures of governance seen elsewhere. The UCRD's extreme measures, including acts of violence against those who got even close to their borders, they sought to unite the desert under their banner. The UCRD, driven by an unwavering belief in communism, initiated a movement to share their vision with neighboring nations. Armed with books that informed of their ideology, they embarked on a mission to convert others. The UCRD ventured into the northern nation of Urbis, attempting to share their communist manifesto. The UCRD members faced unexpected resistance from Urbis players who, in an act of defiance, attempted to burn the books. This symbolic rejection became the catalyst for a dramatic turn of events as the UCRD, angered by the perceived disrespect to their ideology, declared war on Urbis. In response to the UCRD threat, the nation of Mycelium sided with Urbis in the war. But strangely, the nation of Farmo initially sided with the UCRD in this conflict. However, internal dissent quickly eroded this alliance, with Farmo citizens growing increasingly disappointed over their government's decision. Faced with mounting unrest, Farmo ultimately withdrew from the war, leaving the UCRD to face the Urbis Mycelium alliance alone. On day 61-28, the three nations converged in the heart of the desert, giving birth to the Battle of the Desert. The clash of ideologies, the echoes of burning books, and the future of the desert set the stage for a conflict that went beyond mere territorial disputes. It was a battle of ideas, a struggle for the very soul of the desert.
After a long, intense battle, the UCRD emerged victorious, and without hesitation invaded the Urbis capital. The UCRD swiftly took over the capital, and Urbis and Mycelium had to surrender. The founder of the UCRD has achieved his goal. After a long war, the entire desert would fall under the banner of Kamya- Wait, why is the UCRD on fire? Well, turns out having no centralized government causes the population to fall into chaos. And that's exactly what happened to the UCRD. The members realized that with no laws and no rules, they could do whatever they wanted and looted, pillaged, murdered, and robbed everything the UCRD once was. Hey Mark, I'm gonna steal your newborn. What? You can't do that. Who's gonna stop me? Uh, the government... Oh, we don't have one of those. He's mine. Many players would leave the UCRD, and within a few hours after the war, the UCRD was gone. Just hours ago, Urbis and Mycelium were about to be forced into an anarchist communist regime. But now with the UCRD gone, they were still free. But this war wouldn't be for nothing. The nations of the desert used this as an opportunity, and to prevent something like this from ever happening again, they all united as the Urbis Myceptium Imperium. While the desert celebrates not being forced into an anarchist communist dystopia, the rest of the world was prospering. Well, except these guys. All was well in the kingdom until the queen, unhappy with the monarchy, decided to vanish into the vast wilderness, leaving behind Venoria. The queen equipped with nothing but an iron pickaxe and a hatred for the kingdom of Venoria, for reasons I don't know, would go on to create their own nation, Vicentia, all under the plan of declaring a war on Venoria to claim Venoria for themselves. A few days after formation, Vicentia declared war on Venoria, and Venoria was shocked to say the least. A former queen who was one of the leaders of Venoria is now declaring a war on Venoria to become the leader of Venoria again? Meanwhile, in the neighboring lands, Caesarea, a chill nation, decided to go full support with Vicentia, throwing themselves into a war that really didn't involve them. Hey Caesarea, I'm going to war with Venoria to fulfill my own bloodthirsty ambitions, to retake the throne that I once had, all because I want to regain power that I once had, but abandoned for a reason no one really knows. You had me at war. On the flip side, Tribella, a nation with close relations to Venoria, dating back to the Amthalan days, joined forces with Venoria, ready to defend the central nations of Kray La Hoya. But just when this war was about to play out, enter Dallenheim, a nation that jumped into the war to help Vicentia. But in a plot twist that would make Herobrine himself raise an eyebrow, they were persuaded by Vanoria to exit the war, because turns out, Dallenheim didn't even know why they were going to war. Okay, basically, the once leader of Vanoria, who had a lot of power and was queen because we let them become queen, suddenly left Vanoria because, well, we don't really know why, but I guess it made sense to them. Is a hot Anyways, dog they a left sandwich? Eventually made their oh own. no. I'm not even paying attention. I don't know what he's saying. Okay, I'll just agree to whatever he says. So we don't understand why you want to fight us. Yes. The battlefield was getting ready. Armor and weapons being forged. Banners being raised. But then another unexpected event took place. Caesarea disbanded just before the war due to a population crisis. It turns out their citizens were more interested in pixel art and creative mode builds than the art of war. With Caesarea out of the picture and Vicentia facing the consequences of their own actions, surrender was the only option. Tribella and Venoria emerged victorious, but for some reason, Tribella comes out of this conflict with Vicentia becoming their domain, and Venoria got absolutely nothing. Well, to say they got nothing would be a slight lie, because what they did get was a very low population. Not because they lost a bunch of players, they just always had a low population. But with the queen gone, the population dipped under the line of probably gonna disband. And so after all of this, Vanorian government collapsed and the people fled the nation. Vanoria fell, and Marina would consume the Vanoria capital Madheim. This would become known as the Great Vanorian Collapse. What started as a friendly gesture to help a neighboring nation in distress led to the betrayal and downfall of Vanoria. Over in the desert, the empire, now called the Iradian Empire, was on the rise, becoming the most populated nation on the continent, surpassing Farmo. 
and Farmo was not too pleased with this. However, Farmo was known for their interesting and sometimes strange approaches to their problems. This time, they favored negotiations over warfare. The two nations sat down at the negotiation table, and the leaders of Farmo, a group of eccentric diplomats, proposed a deal. A deal where the Iranian Empire was to deliver not one, but two sets of armor to Farmo, in exchange for the Iranian Empire getting free travel through the Farmo land and waters. The reason? Well, who wouldn't want to jazz up their nation with a couple of fancy armor sets? However, days passed, and Farmo anxiously awaited the arrival of their fancy armor. But the Iranian Empire seemed to have forgotten about their end of the bargain. Just when Farmo was on the brink of a full-scale war, a random player from the Iranian Empire stumbled upon the armor sets. And like some side quest he just discovered, he attempted to give the armor sets to Farmo. But unfortunately for him, this side quest led to the boss battle. Farmo had enough of waiting, and decided that the only logical course of action was to declare war on the Iranian Empire. A war over missing armor, you ask? Well, in the strange world of Farmo, anything was possible. As the declaration of war echoed, both nations called on one of their allies, dragging Paxterra and Eskatan into the war. The Iranian Empire and Paxterra built up a fort and stationed there, waiting for Farmo to make their move. Farmo and Eskatan grouped up and would charge at the fort. The four nations clashed, arrows flying through the sky as the battle went on, players from both sides were slowly picked off, a battle that would last roughly four days. Farmo and Eskatan would eventually make a final push, hoping to finally end this battle before running out of armor and resources. Trying to break through the fort over the span of another day, Farmo and Eskatan would eventually take over the fort and kill off the remaining Iradians and Paxterans. The air was filled with a strange mix of jubilation and laughter, as Farmo celebrated their triumph over the Iradian Empire. However, Farmo's celebration was short-lived. Perhaps driven by the lingering frustration from the missing armor situation, Farmo declared harsh reparations against the nations of Iranian Empire and Pax Terra. However, Farmo's ally Eskatan voiced concerns of the punishment, saying they were too harsh and severe, and demanded fair reparations instead. The other nations in Kralahoya saw that this situation needed some de-escalation, and they decided that enough was enough. Nations from all corners of the continent came together and essentially told both Farmo and the Iranian Empire, hey. Knock it off. And just like that, the war was over, and reparations were thrown out the window, and no one owned anything to anyone. The international community, realizing the absurdity of the entire situation, decided it was better to just pretend the war never happened, hoping to throw the whole thing under the rug. And surely, this won't have any consequences in the future. But as the dust settled on the battlefield of absurdity, the leaders of Farmo found themselves facing an unexpected twist of fate. Whether due to the stresses of war, the strain of managing a nation, or simply the whims of the universe, the Farmo leaders disappeared, never to be seen again. With the departure of its leaders, Farmo experienced a power vacuum that proved too challenging to fill. The once thriving nation crumbled like a house of cards. The land of Farmo was divided among three neighboring nations. And just like that, Farmo was gone. But as day 10,000 dawned upon the server, a sense of anticipation enveloped Kralahoya. The fall of Farmo marked the end of an era, but it also signaled the beginning of something new. In the void left by Farmo's collapse, the whispers of a rising empire echoed through the hills and valleys of Kray La Hoya. The stage was set for the next act in Kray La Hoya's unpredictable history. While we move on to the next 10,000 days of the Rise and Rule server, let's quickly take a moment of silence for the great nation of Farmo. Psych! Thank you so much for watching, I really hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you did, please leave a like and subscribe as it helps me out a bunch. Also, huge shout out to all the Patreon supporters, it means a lot, and if you want to join the Discord, the link is in the description. And for everyone wondering how to join the server, you could join the Discord, and then there's a Frequently Asked Questions uh, channel, and it'll tell you how to join the server. So, if you want to join the server, join the Discord, and you can do that. Okay, um, peace out, thank you for watching. Till next time.